Okay, hands up. Who has been to the top of the Worcester Beacon? Yeah, most of you. On the top of the Worcester Beacon, there is this granite memorial. It, is, it was erected in 1837, 60 years of Queen Victoria's reign. And most of you have seen that. And on top is the toposcope that shows you what you can see in, in the distance. There's a scripture written around the top. What does it say? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In fact, there it is. That's from the authorized version. Uh, we had it read to us at the bit well, we read it ourselves at the beginning from the NIV. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So whose is the earth? The Lord's, the God who created it. Now, when I've been up there, I don't know how many times, hundreds, perhaps even thousands over the years. When you look out from the top of the hills, you can see for miles and miles and miles. And it's great that that scripture is written around there. Uh, I guess a lot of people reading it think, if they notice it at all, I wonder what that means. You know, we live in what's been called a post-Christian society. Many people won't know that that's a quote from the Psalms. In fact, some years ago, somebody took a big hammer to it and tried to smash it. And they didn't get very far because it's really tough Cornish granite. They knocked a chunk off, but the word of God still remains. It's said that if you stand on the beacon, you can see all the way up to the Peak District in Cheshire. You need a telescope to be able to see it. And you can see Charmed Forest in Leicestershire, where Sir David Attenborough and I spent many happy hours in our teenage years exploring nature. Now, Sir David's older than me by at least 20 years or so. So I didn't actually meet him out there in the forest, but uh, it's, it's a wonderful place. As we look out from the hills, we see a man-made landscape, you know, the fields, the villages, the towns, the roads, all those things are man-made. Human beings put them there. In fact, even the hills themselves, which used to be covered in trees, most of those have now gone. And we've got man-made paths and all sorts of things. So we see a man-made landscape. But it's a living landscape. As we look out, you see most of the fields are grass. You see trees, you see hedgerows. They are all living things, the plants that are clothing the ground and of course all the animals the invertebrates and so on the birds uh, living in that landscape so we see this vast panorama but we also see those living things and we live in or should we say on this beautiful world but sadly it has been and is being damaged by human activity you know we're the only species on the planet that has done as much as we've done in terms of modifying the, uh, the landscape and the environment in which we live. But it wasn't always like that. When God made it, he looked at it and said, that last verse that, that Andy read, God saw that it was very good. Now, I take that to mean there wasn't death and decay and suffering in the original creation. That has come in through human sinfulness, and things aren't looking good for our planet. There's a great deal of concern over things such as climate change, pollution of the air, the oceans, rivers and streams, as well as the land itself. Now, 53 years ago, in 1970, the environmental movement really took off. And yesterday was Earth Day, commemorating 53 years of the environmental movement movement we need actually to zoom on a few slides um god saw it was good beautiful place the theme for this year's earth day is investing in the planet that is what we can do to try to make this world a better a safer place in which to live now it's interesting that when we plan to have this service on this day 
we hadn't remembered that yesterday was Earth Day. And in fact, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday of this week are a whole period of time of mass demonstrations around the world and in this country. In fact, this morning in Westminster, there will be a massive collection of people uh, demonstrating to say to the government, you need to do something. We need to do something about the situation that is happening in the world. And I, I don't know, I, I ran my marathon years ago in 1983, Birmingham Peoples, three hours, 46 minutes. I don't know what I could do it in now, even if I tried. But the London Marathon's happening this morning. I don't know whether it is being disrupted by just stop oil or um, insulate Britain gluing themselves to the road, even though Extinction Rebellion said they're going to try and prevent uh, those demonstrations, but we shall catch up with that uh, later. The biggest issue that's being spoken about much at the moment is that of climate change. Now, I've looked at the evidence and there's lots of it, and I believe that the climate is changing. We're seeing hotter temperatures, we're seeing extremes of weather. In fact, Thailand this week had its highest recorded daytime temperature 45.2 degrees. That's not the hottest it's been on Earth. We've had temperatures over 50 degrees. In dry countries, in a humid country like Thailand, that means death. Because if you can't sweat to cool down, you overheat and you die. So that is happening even now in our day. It's called the big one because the demonstrations going on now uh, these various organizations, organizations hope that it will have an effect on our government and on the governments of the nations of the earth. In fact, you will see a lot of those organizations present, along with Christian organizations like Tear Fund and so on, uh, taking part. This is part of the evidence, the increase in carbon dioxide levels. Um, even when I was at school, um, it was seen to be stable at about 35 parts per million, but now it's, it's been increasing since the Industrial Revolution. You can see that almost exponential curve on the right there, uh, which is thought to be responsible for the greenhouse effect, the trapping in of solar radiation and the increase in our temperature. Simple little graphic to show what it used to be down at the bottom, keeping 1.5 Celsius alive, uh, and also up there, which shows what current targets um, are aiming for, but also further up is what the range of what current policies might achieve. So it's way above what uh, we would hope. And we don't know what effect those temperature changes will have because it may not just be a gradual change. It may reach a point where the pressure is so great, there's a catastrophic collapse in our atmospheric system. Don't want to bring doom and gloom, but that is the prospect if things are not done. Which is why a lot of young people, particularly well-educated, informed young people are protesting. And the young lady on the right there saying, you'll die of old age, but I'll die of climate change. I don't know whether that's necessarily going to be true, but that is the prospect, that is the thought that a lot of young people have. Uh, we all know Greta Thunberg and her Friday school protests and her speeches to the UN and so on. She's a representative of that generation who are blaming us for the state of affairs, the way that we have utilized the Earth's resources in a thoughtful, a thoughtless way. And it does seem that despite all the talk at COP conferences and so on, very little action has been taken. Lots of talk about what we might do, but not actual um, happening. And it's true that at the moment we see, you know, we're quite happy to fly around the world. 
eat meat and dairy products, use energy as though it was unlimited, and politicians, particularly in this country, are always talking about economic growth. What we need is economic growth. Let's bring the taxes down so you can spend more money, we can make more stuff, we can buy more stuff. Let's have economic growth. That is unsustainable. I'm sure you will appreciate that. You cannot go on using the Earth's resources in the way that we are without suffering consequences. But when we look at the measures that are needed to halt, well, not halt, even slow down, climate change they are so drastic that no government that i can think of is willing to implement them particularly in the democracies where they'd be voted out of office in no time those measures are drastic the changes we need to make to our lifestyles are so great we can't even contemplate thinking about them we may think about the little things we can do but they're not enough they're not big enough they're not strong enough to achieve what we need to do. But there is this cry that goes up, technology will save us. We'll all drive electric cars. We'll have um, heat exchange systems in our homes to uh, save us using gas and so on. We'll have hydrogen powered cars. We'll have carbon capture and storage. There are lots of things we can do, well, possibly, but I don't think it will be enough, quick enough, to do what is necessary. Now, sadly, the effects that are happening are affecting the poor and undeveloped countries far more than the developed West, which is why Tear Fund, Christian organization, is talking so much about climate justice you know, the islands in the Pacific that are being slowly drowned under rising sea levels. Countries that are suffering droughts, as Jean mentioned in her prayers, Ethiopia, going through yet another drought. But other places suffering storms and floods, extreme events, wildfires that have never been before. The giant redwoods in America they used to be able to survive fires that were so big, they got such insulated bark and so tall, they could survive the fires. But they're not now. The fires are so hot and so big and so strong, they're being killed. It's a symbol of the state to which we have got. Now, this is present reality. It's not something that might happen in the future. And I don't know if global action will ever be taken to address those things. But there's another part to the story. We read this morning from Romans. Creation is waiting, is looking, it's expectant. You know, a few weeks ago, Trish was waiting for the arrival of Emily. You know, it's got to come. <laughs> Creation's in that same state. It's waiting. It's not waiting for us to join the eco movement. It's not waiting for us to go and protest outside Parliament. It's waiting for us to be revealed as the children of God. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For creation was subject to frustration, not by its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay, and along with decay comes death. Death came in because of sin. And it's waiting to be brought, that's the whole of creation, into the glorious freedom of the children of God. You know, we have a future and a hope, and it's not a post-apocalyptic earth, a smoking ruin left. We're looking forward to the day when Jesus comes back. And when he comes back, we were revealed with him as the children of God. 
and this whole creation will be released from that bondage to death and decay. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't try to do what we can to lower our, or reduce, sorry, our carbon footprint. Lots of things we can do. We mentioned them before, and I'll send out another leaflet to the church um, from Eco Church and uh, the Baptist Union um, Ecological Network, uh, Environmental Network, uh, when, uh, of measures that we can personally take as, as individuals and as a church. But what Paul is saying in that letter to the Romans is that creation is waiting for that day when all that has happened through the millennia that we've been here on earth will be repaired, mended, when Jesus returns. I don't believe that human beings have either the ability or the will to get us out of the mess that we've got ourselves into. Only God can do it. Only God can do it. And there's the promise that he will, that there'll come a day when the eager expectation of the whole creation will be seen. Now this is actually a J.B. Phillips translation. The whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God come into their own. Now, when Lindsay and I got married back in um, 1977, we had dancing in the service. Um, I took up my guitar and some of the young folks in the uh, fellowship danced to a song called Tiptoe. It's a song by the Fisher folk back in the, the, the 70s. And it was based on the words of this song. All creation is expectant, is waiting, is on tiptoe, looking for that day when the children of God will be revealed because our King, Jesus, is coming back. I'm going to make a big badge for the coronation. And it says on it, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. As I know we'll be celebrating the coronation of King Charles III, but we have a king who is seated on a throne in heaven. But there'll come a day when he sits on a throne here on earth. Where will that be? In Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And he will reign over the whole earth in justice and in peace. There's a wonderful verse that's repeated in Isaiah and in the book of Micah. And every man beneath his vine and fig tree will live in peace and unafraid. And nations will turn their swords into plowshares and they will study war no more. And every man neath his vine and fig tree will live in peace and unafraid. That day is coming. But in the meantime, I believe there'll be some difficulties. The Bible tells us about that. But look to the future. Look to the day when Jesus the King is coming back. And Paul writes in his letter to Titus that we look for the glorious appearing of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He's coming back, and we are his. Now, if we have died in the meantime, we'll come with him. But if we're still here, he's coming for us, because as Paul says, we will be caught up and meet him in the air, and so we shall be with him forever. He will rule and reign on the earth, and we will be with him. And after that, there is the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwells righteousness forever. You know, there's a glorious prospect for the children of God in the future. I believe it's not too far away. In the meantime, there are struggles. Paul said in, in the 
uh, early part of that reading. I don't count the sufferings of this present age anything to be concerned about, my paraphrase, compared to what is coming. Yeah? What is creation waiting for? It's waiting for the Creator to come, but it's also waiting for us, the children of God, to be revealed in glory with Him. Now, are you His? Do you belong to Jesus? Are you a follower, a disciple of Jesus? Are you looking forward to His coming with joyful anticipation? Or are you thinking, I don't know? I don't know what Jesus will say to me when he comes back. You can be sure. You can be sure. Come to Jesus. You know, he's done everything. Everything that needs to be done for you to become his. You don't have to jump through hoops, keep rules, do stuff. All you have to do is three words. Sorry, please, and thank you. Jesus, I'm sorry that I live my life my way. Please forgive me. And thank you for all that you've done for me. Now, Jesus' gift to us is free. Paul says the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But it doesn't matter how good the free gift is, it's not yours until you receive it. You need to say, yes, please, that's for me. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you don't know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, please don't put it off. Come and talk to me or Dave or, or anybody in the fellowship who uh, you feel you can, you can chat with and they'll pray with you and help you to make that step because it is a step from death into life. There's a little booklet called Journey Into Life that was around when I was a teenager. And that's what it is. It's the first step in a new life, a life with Jesus, so that we look forward to his coming back. This is a beautiful world, but it needs mending. Jesus is the one who's going to mend it. And our lives need mending let jesus do it let jesus do the job that only he can do let's pray jesus we thank you that you're working to a plan that you know exactly what's going to come what is there in store for us in the future lord we know that in you we have a hope a certainty and we can trust in you so Jesus, we thank you for all that you've done and all you're going to do in our lives and in this world. Praise be to you, Lord. Amen.